Hey everyone, Rich Gassaway here. Before I get into today's episode, I want to let you know that I have a few openings remaining in the fall schedule for situational awareness programs. Has your department hosted a situational awareness matters tour stop yet? No? Seriously? What are you waiting for? Did you know that issues related to situational awareness or the barriers that flaw situational awareness are implicated in nearly every significant firefighter casualty report? It's a really, really big deal. The problem is most firefighters know so little about it. They think so long as they pay attention or keep their head on a swivel that they'll have good situational awareness. And as anyone who's attended any of my programs know, this simply is not the case. Sure, paying attention is part of the situational awareness development process, but it isn't all of it. There is so much more to this. Those who think that it's just about paying attention are simply uninformed. Don't be uninformed on a topic that this is this important, a topic that can literally save your life. There's too much at stake as situational awareness serves as the foundation for good decision making and it's the decision making that drives the actions that lead to successful outcomes or catastrophic outcomes. If you're interested in getting a program scheduled, visit samatters.com and click on the contact us link and we'll get something set up for you this fall. Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. This is Captain Dave Martin, Health and Safety Officer for Yakima County Fire District 5, and you are listening to SA Matters Radio Show with Dr. Rich Gassaway. The SA Matters mission is simple. They want to help us see the bad things coming. It's time to avoid bad outcomes. Hello and welcome to episode 116 of the Situation Awareness Matters Radio Show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence environments. The SA Matters mission is simple, to help you see the bad things coming and time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from Ames, Iowa, where I'm in town to deliver a situation awareness program for the Iowa Fire Training Bureau. This is the second time Situation Awareness Matters Tour has stopped in Ames. Thank you to the Iowa Fire Training Bureau for the faith and confidence in my message. From the program here in Ames, I go on to Overland Park, Kansas for a program tomorrow, and then on to Shawnee, Oklahoma for a program on the following day. Because these departments were able to schedule their programs back-to-back or consecutively, each department received a substantial discount in their program fee. If you're interested in attending an upcoming Situation Awareness Matters tour stop, head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. More than 500 agencies on four continents have hosted Situation Awareness Matters tour stop events. I mentioned at the beginning of the show that I'm booking the programs for the fall of 2016. I'm also actively booking the 2017 programs now. So if you're interested in something way out in 2017, now is the time to get scheduled. Here's a tip for how you can host a program at a reduced cost. I I schedule many what I call companion programs. Those are the programs on adjoining days to other programs. So if you see I'm delivering a program within a few hours of your department, and you think you might want to come along as a companion, contact me. You can save as much as 20% off the program cost by being a companion to an existing program. That's what I did this week with Ames and uh, Overland Park and um, Shawnee, Oklahoma. That's what I did when I was in Texas. That's what I did when I was in Washington State and also in Michigan. So there's lots of opportunities to be a companion. 
Okay, in today's feature segment, I'm interviewing Battalion Chief Ryan Pyle of the Shawnee, Kansas Fire Department. On May 22, 2010, John Glazer, a 33-year-old career firefighter, died while conducting a primary search at a residential fire. Firefighter Glazer vomited in his SCBA face piece and then removed it, causing him to inhale products of combustion. The fire was reported at 13408 West 75th Court, and when the firefighters arrived, they found the home burning out of control. Neighbors told firefighters that they thought two people and a dog were inside. Firefighters began attack on the fire and searching the home, and as they were searching the home just a little bit after 9 p.m., a mayday call went out because a firefighter was missing. I'm going to jump into the feature segment now, but when I get done, stick around because I'm going to announce the upcoming Situation Awareness Matters Tour Stop event schedule. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment with Ryan Pyle from the Shawnee, Kansas Fire Department talking about their line of duty death event. On May 22nd, uh, 2010, uh, we uh, were for career department uh, in the suburb of Kansas City. We operate um, kind of as a, as a county department. There's separate, there's separate departments in the county, uh, but it's a centralized dispatching system, uh, centralized ambulance. Uh, we train together frequently, and rarely uh, do we run calls as far as structure fires that are uh, just in our um, just with our jurisdiction alone. Uh, so that, that's kind of an important part of the story because it, it, it factors in, in, in later. And, and for those that uh, were able to uh, read the NIOSH report on this, you'll see different jurisdictions, but we all, we all operate under the same, same guidelines. Um, uh, that day I was stationed at uh, Station 71. Um, and out of Station 71, we run a uh, ladder truck and a uh, engine and a battalion chief. Um, that particular day, we were at our minimums, which is three and three. Uh, that's something um, that that's fairly common, uh, especially that time of year, getting into the summertime. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Glazer and uh, my driver and I were. Um, had a fairly busy day. Uh, the we uh, again we we work so closely with the adjoining jurisdictions. There's no green space in between our streets. It's all Johnson County, Kansas has become all one one big mass. So you would you were, we're we're constantly somewhere else. And in that particular day, we were at um, the Overland Park Fire Department, and, and uh, we were filling in for them. Um, while well, they had a, an event, what they call the Special Needs Day, and this is something we've done on an annual basis to assist them and and support their cause, and uh, we were there that day uh, while we were at at their station forty one. Uh, I believe we ran a couple calls, fairly regular, just EMS calls. Uh, the company uh, back at station seventy one had a really busy day. Uh, they ran a uh, infant drowning a day, a two-year-old. Uh, mm-hmm. It was uh, so it was a busy day. Um, hold on, hold on a second. Let me ask you a question. Okay. So essentially, your engine crew, which was an on-duty crew, was a, was lent over to Overland Park because they had an event going on, and you just kind of filled in at their station uh, for that period of time. Is that was what's happening here? Yeah, that's correct. Is that pretty normal for for that region to do that kind of thing? Yeah, it, it is. It's it's very normal uh, okay. for us. It, it, again, we we operate as a, as a almost a county department without without a, actually being one. We we uh, provide mutual aid. It's a, 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 as a matter of fact, it's a matter of practice that it's it's almost an automatic aid. Wow. Uh, with the centralized dispatching system, mm-hmm. um, you get a complement of, of essentially the four closest units on a structure fire. Um, so it's a really it's a really great system. Nice. Uh, it works really well. 
I can ask for additional units, but on the initial dispatch, I'll typically get the closest units to the alarm, regardless of jurisdiction. So for us to go over to another organization to fill in for them or uh, if they have a structure fire or to assist them, that, that's, that's completely normal operations for us. Nice. Okay. So you guys are covering Overland Park. They're on an event. And you, you said you ran a few calls, but your, but your regular station 71 was pretty busy that day. Yeah, Station 71 was extremely busy that day. They had some, uh, again, some some fairly traumatic calls, uh, which we weren't involved in. Um, over there at Station 41 was, you know, a fairly normal day. We, we ran a few calls, EMS-based, um, and... You, this is something that typically you probably wouldn't talk about on your radio show, but they have a they have a great barbecue place near there, and uh, we went to eat lunch there. Well, John was a uh, John was a triathlete, so he was in phenomenal shape. Uh, and so the driver and I we we ate the barbecue because we love it, and and that's applicable to this story because of what happened to John. Well, that day John didn't he chose not to eat the barbecue. Um, so we finished our assignment there, um, came back to quarters and I, I, you know, I'd, I can't remember exactly how many calls we ran, but it continued to be a busy day. Um, we had just, uh, we had just finished dinner, uh, doing our thing getting everything cleaned up, getting our station duties done and the truck got sent on an automatic alarm, um, at the address uh, where John uh, ultimately passed. Um, quickly after the alarm, it got upgraded to a uh, regular alarm, and um, that kind of started the ball rolling on this thing. Okay, now what was the um, – so initially the the automatic alarm would be one company, and that would be you guys? Yeah. The truck was uh, sent on the automatic alarm. Uh, shortly thereafter, Engine Engine 71, the company I was on, uh, was sent and uh, upgraded uh, to a to a house fire, um, along with Quint 72, which is a uh, Quint out of uh, Station 72 in Shawnee, and Engine 92, which is uh, out of Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, again, that, that plays into that uh, initial alarm, getting the closest companies to that to that uh, incident. And that sent a uh, battalion chief out of Shawnee and the battalion chief out of Lenexa and a, uh, and a medic unit. Okay. Okay. All right, take it from there. Okay. Um, the truck got about uh, probably two blocks out. Um, reported smoke showing from their location. Uh, so obviously we knew we had a uh, working fire. They were receiving numerous calls on the incident. Um, Battalion 71 gets arrives, uh, reports a working fire from a garage on the Bravo side. Um, this was a, uh, was a large house, uh, 6,000 square feet, um, had a driveway, uh, on the Bravo side that went down to a underneath um, a sub kind of a sub basement and a garage uh, in addition to uh, what what you would consider probably a typical driveway on the alpha side of the house where his daily drivers were uh, the the gentleman was a collector of antique cars and had um, three at least three, antique cars in the bottom basement and that and that's where the point of origin was um we were uh, the truck uh because of the order of how they showed up they were originally uh signed search we were getting reports of uh, an elderly gentleman and a dog inside uh so they were originally assigned search and as we arrived, we were going to establish fire attack. Well, this is one of those things that, you know, they always say that it's a, it's a litany of, of things that lead up to the incident. 
and I'm not sure if this had much bearing on it, but the truck had already had already initiated fire attack, which put us on search. Um, it's been a standard practice uh, for us to have the driver stay with the truck. So John and I uh, were the company uh, that was assigned search. Um, and uh, that was the assignments we were given. And so there was a little bit of confusion initially. Um, and, and, you know, that can, that can cause a little bit of a problem. We got that, we got that sorted out uh, fairly quickly. Um, we had heavy smoke uh, from basically all parts of the structure. Uh, to paint a little bit better picture of, of the structure, again, custom built house, um, large in size, tile roof, and a significant amount of fire load. <clears throat> excuse me, in the basement area. Uh, again, they had fire a significant amount of fire showing from the Bravo side. Um, we I went up to the front door. Uh, kind of peeked around to see exactly what we had. And there was a security door and two giant side lights on the side. Um, I advised command that forcible entry would be needed. Um, so I took out the side lights. I had John uh, go to uh, engine 71 and take a line off that truck. And we proceeded to uh, try to make it into the alpha side of the structure. Um, upon opening the door and the skylights, we had thick, uh, black, uh, turbulent uh, smoke coming out of both of those side lights. Uh, we went in. John had the camera. He was in front of me. He had the line. The line was not charged. Um, Typically, the, for us, especially at that time, um, taking a line in on a search was really officer's discretion. Uh, we didn't do it as a matter of practice. Uh, it was just it was one of those things that if you felt like you needed it, um, you know, you could take it. Uh, that night, I didn't know what we were going to run into, given the amount of fire they had on the Bravo side. I really didn't want to take any chances. So we went in. Uh, did, did you guys, when you were getting ready to make the entry, you talked about the smoke condition. Was it zero visibility for you on entry? Absolutely, zero visibility. Okay. Uh, smoke from floor to ceiling. The, the foyer was uh, um, uh, open all the way um, to the top uh, of the second floor ceiling. All the way down, it was zero visibility. And come to find out, uh, the gentleman had a dog, uh, which plays into the story here in a minute. Um, the gentleman had a dog, and he left his door open from the basement area to the upstairs where the dog could come and go as he pleased. And that, you know, you didn't know at the time, um, but after, after everything was said and done, um, that was that served as a chimney. I, I mean, so the the significant amount of fire and smoke they had was was coming directly up that um, up that stairwell. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a significant amount of heat. Uh, we made it in. We started a right hand search, uh, doing the camera. Um, went down the hallway, and a, a, as we got about. Uh, 20, 25 feet in, uh, I could feel both sides of the hall. It was a really narrow hall. It was a, the house was oddly arranged, but it was built specifically with his, uh, his needs in mind. Uh, he was an elderly gentleman. Yeah. So we, again, a very narrow hallway. I could, I could, I could feel both sides of the hall. Um, as we, as we made our way, um, checking with the imaging camera, uh, we come up to a dog um, right at the entrance of a laundry room. And the dog is making some strange moaning noise, not like a bark, uh, obviously in distress. 
had we not been so close to the uh, doorway, I probably would have, you know, unfortunately had to make that decision to, to bypass the dog. But I told, I told John, grab the dog. Let's get him out to the company that's, that's waiting at, uh, to assist with search. Uh, they were at this time at the front door. So John did so. Uh, he dropped the line right where we found the dog, came back out, dropped the dog. Uh, on the radio traffic, you can hear hear me say, I'm, we're coming out together. I need somebody to grab the dog, and we're going to go back in and, and, and finish our search. Uh, we did that again. John had the camera. We did the same thing again. He went in the front. I was in the back. We straddled the line. We get about halfway as far as we'd been. So if, if I had to, to guess, probably no more than 10 or 15 feet inside the structure. And um, all of a sudden, John said, help me. And I reached out in front of me, couldn't feel him. I reached to the right. I felt a wall. I reached to the left. I felt a wall. Uh, and so I, in my mind, uh, I knew that something was wrong. I, I couldn't put all the pieces together at that time. Uh, but he was saying it in a voice that like you and I are talking in. Uh, so you knew, I knew that, I knew that he was in trouble. Um, no, you say a voice like you and I are talking, like not muffled through a face piece. Exactly. Okay. Hey, like his face piece is off. Right. Okay. And, you know, I'm not sure that I can say with any, uh, any conviction that I knew that night at that time that he was saying it with his, with his mask off. I'm not sure it registered right away, but it didn't take, it didn't take long after that, that I, you know, within minutes, I, it, it came to me, you know, that, that was too clear of a voice. Mm-hmm. Um, so was and, he in front of you or behind you? He was in front of me. Okay. Um, yeah. So given, given what I thought I knew again, which is a, is, is a, is, is kind of a dangerous thing. And then, you know, that's one of the things I learned that night. You, you think you know something and you think you, you have the information you need. Um, if I touched a wall on the right and I touched a wall on the left and I knew I was in a hallway and I had already reached out in front of me, my, the only, my, my thought was the only place he could have gone was in front of me. Um, you know, they, and, and at that point, uh, I waited a couple seconds of yelling his name uh, with no, no response, and I called a mayday. And uh, that, that kind of initiated things. Um, I don't know if this, this is a good time in the interview to talk about this, but one thing that I've, I've done this. I've done this presentation several places throughout the country, just to just to get that message out there um, of what happened to John uh, that evening. And one of the things that I think is really important. I think we do a lot of training in the fire service. At least our organization did on calling a mayday for yourself, um, or when you have uh, when you have an a situation where you absolutely knew what happened. Uh, and what I mean by that, Dr. Gassaway is, you know, you, you've been throughout the country and I'm, I'm sure you've seen all sorts of mayday scenarios. Well, we typically train for, uh, I fell through a floor. Uh, I'm in the basement. I call a mayday or I'm tangled up. Um, I need help. So I call a mayday. Uh, things like that. What I, what I don't, what I encourage people to do and, and something to think about is what do you do when you, you're calling a mayday on somebody else and you don't have the information you need? You know, when, when you can give your location, your unit, you can give, you know, what your assignment was. But what do you do when you don't know what happened? And that's a situation we found ourselves in on May 22nd, 2010, is 
I called a mayday on a guy and I had absolutely no idea what happened to him. So how did that mayday sound? Because after you call a mayday, you have to say something. So, right. so I mean, I totally understand what you're saying and you're right. We don't, we don't train on that. So talk me through, you know, what you're thinking is you're calling the mayday and thinking to yourself, all right, I've called a mayday. Now, how do I describe why I called a mayday? Because it isn't for you and you're, you're, you're spot on. That's not what we practice. Right, well, you know, it, it was, to be honest with you, it was poorly done. I, I mean, and, and, you know, that's, that's <laughs> exposing myself a little bit, but I, but I think that's important. You know, when we're talking about something, something like this, I said, uh, search mayday and, Basically, at that point, I worked off of assumptions. Again, I thought that John had to go ahead of me because he didn't come over me. And he didn't, you know, he wasn't right in front of me because I had, I had, I had checked those areas. And so the company's coming in, um, after the May Day was, acknowledged, which was, which was very quick on the part of the incident commander, uh, the company's coming in. I simply had no information to give them. And I, uh, I can't tell you how horrible of a feeling that is. Uh, and I remember talking to the captain that was coming in on Quint 72 to assist, assist me with search initially. Uh, but what he ended up by proxy becoming a, uh, a, a red supervisor and I just remember him telling, tell, I remember telling him we're right here. We were right here. He said, help me. And he's gone. Uh, so, to, so to answer your question, that was, that was just about all I could say. Um, I knew he didn't fall through the floor. Uh, I knew that, um, nothing fell on him. Um, but it was, it was, Nothing, nothing other, other than that. I could give them no information, and, and that was a horrible feeling. Well, well, okay, he didn't fall through the floor. Nothing fell on him. What are you thinking? I mean, you got to be wondering where did he go, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 ahead of me, because because as I as I said before, ahead of me was areas we had just been. I mean, literally. Within minutes, we had, you know, we came out, we went back the exact same way we came. So I knew there was a garage. Uh, I, and if we were on a right-hand search. I knew there was a, um, what I now know is an office, but I, I knew there was a small room off to our right. I knew there was a laundry room because that's where we found the dog. What I didn't know was on the other side of the hallway was a set of uh, double doors, uh, window double doors that led to a sitting room, which led to uh, pocket doors that led to a bedroom with another set of doors that led to a bathroom. And again, another set, two sets of doors leading to a, uh, like a sitting room and a closet. Um, and, that, and that's where this gentleman spent the majority of his time. Um, it wasn't on the second floor. It wasn't your typical living quarters. Uh, his his existence was pretty much on that first floor. And that's what I didn't know. And um, that's where John went. Hmm. So why? Do you, do you have any idea as to what what drove that? Well, we do now. Um, okay. at, the time, at the time, I didn't. Um, and uh, again, this is a this is another oddity. Uh, and, and earlier in the uh, presentation, I talked about John not eating lunch, and he ate a moderate dinner because you know John was a great athlete. Um, what what ended up happening? What it he John vomited in his mask, and during that process of vomiting, he ripped his mask off. And once that happened, uh, they believe, uh, investigators believe 
help me was all he could get out. And that was the last thing we heard. Um, took him about, I believe, nine minutes or so to find John. Uh, they got me out of there. I was completely out of air. Um, it, it, it took, it took that period of time to find him. A couple interesting things about it. Uh, he, they, his radio was on, on him. The radio was in the, on the right channel. Um, until they got right on top of him, they never heard his pass device. Uh, his pass, he was laying on his pass device and they literally were right on top of him. So these, you know, these, as this incident was unfolding, there was a lot of things that didn't make sense. You know, if he threw up, why didn't I hear a gag? Um, why, why did I not hear him yell? Why did I not hear a pass device? So all these things made for, for me, a, a very difficult situation because all of those things you think of when you think of May Day, um, they just weren't there. Uh, you know, again, starting out, I didn't have the information that I needed to pass on to the crews. I didn't have, I didn't hear a pass device. Uh, I didn't hear anything. Um, matter of fact, nobody heard anything from John after that point. Numerous attempts were made to contact him and there was, there was just, there was no contact. Um, they, they obviously analyzed the air, air cylinder and pack and uh, he turned it off, turned it back on. Uh, so, you know, it, it was, it was a very short time before he became very disoriented. Um, I, I believe that was, um, that, that, that's what got us to where we were. Yeah. Ultimately he, he vomited in his mask and, and pulled his mask off. Now, when you, <clears throat> when you guys were in there, you said you, you had a thermal imager. Did he have it or did you have it? He did. He had it. So yeah. that's a, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, that's one of my talking points. And, and, and I'm not, I tell people when I, when I, when I talk to people about this incident, I, I tell them the story. I tell them what, you know, what I, what it meant to me. Um, I don't try to speak from the incident commander's standpoint. I don't try to speak from the, uh, the writ supervisor standpoint because I, I don't think that's doing it justice, but speaking from, from my experience, I encourage people to have the conversation about who has the camera. Um, that night when John went, when he, when he took off his mask and what I believe he thought he was exiting the building, he just went the wrong way. Unfortunately, my eyes went with him. Now we ended up finding the camera later, but I encourage, I encourage you to, to, to have those, those conversations around the, you know, around the uh, table at dinner. All right. Who has the camera? If you don't have a policy on it or it's left to the discretion of the officer, somebody should have that conversation and, and, and say, you know, we need to know who's going to have the camera and have some justification why. Uh, in our department, I think in large part now the officer has the camera and, and sets back a little bit as opposed and, and manages their companies as opposed to, uh, at that night, he and I were right on top of each other. And when he, when he took off, he took the camera with him. Mm -hmm. So it, it left me at a disadvantage. Now, when you called the Mayday, was there already established on the scene a writ team or did that kind of get, impromptu organized. I don't know where this is at and the timing of other companies coming in stuff. So, you know, who, who served as the writ team? Was it already established or did they ad hoc it together? Well, it, it was in the, it was in the process of being established. You're waiting for companies to arrive. Mm -hmm. um, so Clint 72's officer, who was a, an extremely seasoned, um, Ex extremely knowledgeable still he's retired now and a chief in a different organization but 
there would have been nobody better to have as a writ supervisor than, than him. And he, by proxy, he became he became the writ supervisor. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so to answer your question, it wasn't set up yet. Uh, this unfolded within. Uh, I can't remember. I'd have to look at the timeline again. It, it was six, seven minutes upon our arrival. Wow. You know, so th- this was, you know, it, it was, it was, it was quick. It was real quick. And, and, and regardless of the size of the building, um, I, I, uh, I think that, I think that people get caught up in that a lot. They go, well, you know, the bigger the structure. Yeah. You ha- you have some challenges. I was in a 6,000 square foot house, but I lost John in 200 square feet of that. Mm-hmm. So don't let the size of the building or the size of the house give you, you know, give you some false sense of security. Mm-hmm. Because once his, once he took his mask off, that was, we were on a very, very, very short window. Great. Man, we just couldn't get to him in time. Did the, did the red team have a thermal image or two? Yes, um, they did. Um, the captain at the time uh, became red supervisor. He did an excellent job of allocating companies. Uh, he um, did a great job of having uh, people ready uh, to come in and to monitor the fire. And again, another one of those, I, I may be getting ahead of you here, but another one of those lessons learned um, when, when a May Day happens, I think we can train for it. We can be as prepared as we can be. But one of the things I think gets lost is, uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got a real dangerous situation that hasn't been mitigated happening while that and now you have a mayday on top of it. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you from from my standpoint, once John went missing, the thought, the fire, and which had by now had made its way to the attic and had, had uh, come through the roof, so we had fire below us, fire above us, that was the last thing on my mind. And I, and I think that's a dangerous situation, and I think that's how... Uh, I think that's how we get into situations where where we lose more than one guy. We it, it compounds itself. Because mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just being honest. I didn't think about the fire. No, you were focused on rescue. I was focused on rescue, which can be can be a real dangerous rabbit hole. But the writ supervisor did a great job of managing both of those things. He wouldn't let companies go anywhere that he didn't know the status of the fire. Uh, so you got to have that guy. You got to have that person that is removed from the immediate mayday and and can manage those things. Because if not, you got everybody wanting to go in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great. I'm good friends with John Sullivan from Worcester, Massachusetts. He and I have had a pretty long relationship, even prior to John dying. And and you know that's one of the things that he always says is. You know, two went in. Okay, and then two more went in. Couldn't find them. Two more went in. You know, how long How long would that have kept going? And, and the fire was getting worse in Wooster. And, and, and until the night that we had the fire that we lost John, I could, I could appreciate it, but now I fully understand it. Mm-hmm. Had we not had the writ supervisor and good safety officers on the outside really monitoring the fire, Everybody would have been focused on the May Day, and one could have turned into multiples real quick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So the red team comes in, takes them, I think you said, nine minutes to find him? Yeah, about, uh, thereabouts. I, I, don't have the, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but, yeah, thereabouts. Okay. All right. Talk us through what happens then. Okay. Well, they, they, they announced that they found him. Uh, they bring him out the front door. Uh, Johnson County Med Act is um, right at the front door awaiting him. And, you know, there's there's things that bring this to life. I, you know, and, and that was one of those moments for me. You know, I was outside at this point, obviously. 
I wasn't the best person to have in there at that time. Uh, after that, I wasn't going to go back in. I'd given him the information I could. We had very good, capable firefighters in there looking for him, and I was only I, – I, I didn't have a company, uh, for one. Uh, but, you know, one of those things that, that always sticks out in my mind is, is watching him bring John out. You know, that, that, that's something that I'll never – never get out of my mind. And I don't want anybody else to ever have to go through that. Um, you know, bringing one of your firefighters out that is your responsibility that you, you know, you've made an oath to do everything you can to protect them. And, you know, he didn't have a helmet, uh, his fit, he had sit on his face. Um, so you can, you know, you can imagine what it looks like. Um, and, you know, they put him on the stretcher and begin, Compressions right away. How, how are you feeling at that point? <sighs> Surreal. Uh, I, I felt like I was in a dream. I felt like, you know, I, I had spent a lot of time with Everyone Goes Home, and I had spent so much time talking about it. But I, I think human nature is, is your I, – I don't think I was naive to think it would never happen to me. But I felt like I had prepared myself to, and, and our companies to be in the best position for it not to happen. So there was a lot going through my mind at that time. It just, it just seemed like, a, it seemed like a, a dream that it, it just didn't seem real. Hmm. All right. So they get him to the ambulance. Uh-huh. And and off he goes. You you remain at the scene. You no longer have a company. So what do you do? What, well, the incident, what would you do there? The incident commander and I uh, went to the hospital, uh, and we went by ambulance. Uh, the The police department had blocked off every intersection from the scene all the way to the local um, hospital. Um, and and I remember coming in uh, the doors to to the emergency room, and I could and I looked over and I could see I could see him working on John, and you know that again another one of those surreal moments, and 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 I remember that night hearing hearing things getting dropped, and you know this was a different level of of you know patient care. Uh, not that they don't give good patient care to everybody, but this was a different level. And, and through our debriefing periods, one of the nurses from Shawnee Mission reached out to me. And, and as, I was, as I was passing John, I remember yelling, come on, Johnny, uh, something to that effect. And, and she said that when she heard me say that, she dropped a vial of, I don't know if it was what it was, of medication. or She said that's when, to her, it became very real. And she realized what she was doing. She wasn't just working on another patient. This was, this was a 33-year-old firefighter. Um, and, and, you know, so when something happens like this, I, I'm not sure everybody, anybody understands, unless they've been through it, how far-reaching it is, how many, how many people it touches uh, in the community, obviously the family, the fire department family, the, you know, fire departments around you, uh, even, the, even to the, the nurses at the, at the trauma center. Uh, so, you know, it, it, you, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely a hard thing to do. Uh, and um, they, they came into uh, the room I was in, and, and they told me John, John was gone. And that, I, I can't really de- describe that in words. Uh, that made it very real. Let's go back to the house fire for just a moment. Was, okay. the, was the owner home? No, he wasn't. Uh, and, you know, much like a lot of the incidents we go to, uh, where somebody says there's a victim. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he was he was out with some friends. 
Wow, this is an amazing interview that I'm having with Battalion Chief Ryan Pyle. The interview actually went a little longer than I anticipated, so I'm going to make this into two episodes. <clears throat> so be sure to check out episode 117 for the second part of this interview. If you've experienced or witnessed a near miss and would like to have a platform to share your lessons learned with others, like Ryan's doing here, please contact me by visiting the essaymatters.com website and clicking on the Contact Us link on the top of the home page. Think about it for a moment. The lessons learned from your near miss, or in this case, a line of duty death, could save the life of another first responder. If you want to share your experiences, contact me. In the next episode, we're going to talk about what happened after the line of duty death and Shawnee in the region, the lessons learned and the things that they changed and their takeaways. So you're not going to want to miss that. Okay, as I always do, I want to take a moment to thank the departments and the organizations that have hosted some of the recent Situational Awareness Matters Tour Stop events. I do this to show my appreciation to the organizations for putting forth the effort to advertise, fund, and promote great training experiences for their members and others in the region. Your efforts to bring this valuable and powerful training on situational awareness and high-risk, high-consequence decision-making to your members and others are greatly appreciated. Recent tour stops included the Eastern Michigan University, the Texas Intrastate Fire Mutual Aid Association Conference, and the Sci Fair Fire Department in Texas. And then when I get home from this trip, I'm going to take a few days off to enjoy the Independence Day holiday with my family. There was a... Uh, not very often my family gets a chance to all get together. Last time I think it was Christmas. So I'm really looking forward to this. If you're interested in joining me for an upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop, um, I am now, as we know, in Iowa at the Fire Training Bureau in Ames. And by the time this podcast airs, I will have completed programs at the Overland Park Fire Department in Overland Park, Kansas which is just adjoining to where Ryan Pyle's department is located. In fact, Ryan was covering the station at Overland Park when they had the line of duty death incident. And then I'm going on to Shawnee, Oklahoma, not to be confused with Shawnee, Kansas, where this line of duty death interview took place. Also, by the time this episode airs, I will... I will be at that moment in the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota for my annual wilderness canoe trip. I take this trip to the Boundary Waters every year and have since 2005. It's the highlight of my summer. Then July 23 to 26, I'll be attending the National Speakers Association annual convention in Phoenix, Arizona. Following the NSA convention, I'm going on a Boy Scout High Adventure trip, sailing off the tip of Florida for 14 days. This will mark my third Boy Scout High Adventure trip. I have two Eagle Scout sons and a third on the way, and a daughter who is a gold award winner for the Girl Scouts. Very impressed with the scouting organizations and what they've been able to do for my kids. The High Adventure trip will entail a two weeks with my 16-year-old on a boat. No distractions for me, no technology for him. This might make a good episode of Survivor. <laughs> Anyhow, then I get back on the road August 17th, 19th, and 20th. I'll be at Fire Rescue International in San Antonio. Thank you to the International Association of Fire Chiefs for giving me the opportunity to present at FRI for more than 10 years in a row now, including the opportunity that was given to me the keynote FRI when it was in Chicago. I'm deeply, deeply honored by your support of my message. August 22 to 26, I will be delivering a Company Officer Development Institute program in Zionsville, Indiana. This will be the 24th offering of the Company Officer Development Institute. The purpose of this program is a week-long Company Officer-focused leadership development program. No PowerPoint, no book, no theory, no baloney, no BS. Just hands-on what Company Officers need to know to be successful in leadership, problem solving, conflict resolution, communications, time management, and more. The whole purpose of it is to keep problems out of the chief's office, to train company officers how to prevent problems and how to solve problems at their level. Then August 27th, I'll be doing an encore program in Zionsville on flawed situational awareness. August 28th, I'll be at the Heartland Deerfield 
Michigan Fire Department doing a flawed situation awareness program. Hey, if you're anywhere in Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, or Wisconsin, that's going to be a great trip to come along as a companion program because I'm driving to these venues. So I'm going to be going from Minnesota down through Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, up to Michigan, and back again. And it'd be a great opportunity to tag along. September 8th, I will be keynoting the Arizona State Fire School in Mesa. It'd be a great opportunity for a companion if you're in Arizona as well. September 10th, I'll be doing a program for Upper Providence Township Fire Department in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. Great opportunity for a companion if you're in Pennsylvania, Maryland, or New Jersey. September 13th and 14th, I'll be at the Horry County Fire Department. This is in the Myrtle Beach area. Second time for Horry County. Thank you, uh, Doug Klein and the staff at Horry County. It's great companion if you're in South Carolina or North Carolina. September 23rd, I'll be keynoting the Wisconsin Fire Chiefs Association Conference. September 29th, a program for the Welcome Fire Department in Minnesota. September 30th, I will be delivering the keynote for the recruit class graduation for the Sioux Falls Fire Department and also doing an encore program for their leadership team. Thank you so much to all the program hosts, and here's hoping there will be a tour stop near you and we'll get a chance to meet up. The last time I was delivering Situational Awareness Program in southwest Minnesota, I got a chance to stop by my sponsor for this podcast, Midwest Fire. Midwest Fire makes all poly fire apparatus, and it's changing the industry. You seriously need to check them out at MidwestFire.com. Anyhow, I got a chance to sit down and talk to a few of their employees about what separates Midwest Fire from their competitors. Let's listen into the conversation that I had with account executive Dalton Lingbeck about the custom built and stock apparatus and inventory and how to start the process for designing and building your fire truck. All right, Dalton, do you guys have, do you do custom builds? Or do you do stock builds? Or do you do both? Do you maintain an inventory of trucks that people can just, you know, um, you know, buy buy today and have delivered tomorrow? How, how does all that work? Well, we actually do both. And uh, as much as we can keep stock trucks on hand, we have an inventory, but that's the hard part. Um, we do a lot of custom trucks every year. Uh, it's what we do. I mean, we are here to build what the department needs. Um, but we also do stock trucks because a lot of people are in immediate need of a truck. Um, we do stock 3000s, we do stock 2000s, we do stock brush trucks. It really depends uh, on what has gone out the door. Uh, we try to slot out two production spots uh, a quarter for stock units. Um, and on our website, you'll see the stock, you'll see stock units on our website, you'll see descriptions for them, you'll see specs, but they're not necessarily always in stock. There are standard builds, quote unquote. Um, so the best thing for you to do is if you're in need of a truck sooner than later, don't hesitate and call us up and see what we have on hand. Because right now, I'm looking out the window into our showroom, and we have a stock 3000 sitting there right now. It's ready to go whenever whoever needs it. Yeah, you know, Dalton, you just put, threw a question into my mind. And uh, if somebody is, like, thinking at some point they're going to need a fire truck, how far in advance of needing a fire truck should somebody at least start to make an inquiry and start to have a conversation and establish a rapport and relationship? You know, I'm, I'm guessing it's something short of waking up today and saying we need a truck tomorrow, but you know, putting some thought in the process of what would we want our new truck to have and whether they have a committee or not. How far you, know, you, you, you have a lot of dealings with a lot of customers, and I'm sure you see ones that, are, that, are, that really have it together and ones that are struggling and challenged. How far out for those ones that you would call the success stories? How far out before they they actually you know get to a purchase? Does this dance or this process begin of working with somebody who can help them through through the process? Well, if I understand your question correctly, we're going to kind of not include the people that need the apparatus immediately. Yeah, right, right, right. They, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Um, most success stories, honestly, are six months and more. Uh, you really want to get an idea of. Of what truck you need and what truck you are you guys going to spec out. Uh, the specking out process is the hardest part because you're talking with a lot of people trying to get ideas on the paper and that's what we are here for. We're here to talk about that. Um, but the cool thing about with us is obviously, like I said in a previous question, is that we are direct communication, right? We're directly at the facility. So any questions, all questions that we can't answer are going to be answered no matter what. 
But what you want to do is you want to get specs on the paper, you want to go through those specs, and you want to make sure everything is accurate because the worst thing that can happen is for a truck to be incomplete or wrong when you take delivery of it. And that's what we try to make sure does not happen. Um, so like I said, uh, try to prepare as long as you can beforehand. Obviously, there are situations where it can build up you know, a couple of weeks, and here we go. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for you. We try to make it as comfortable as possible for you. Um, but, yeah, I mean, prepare, prepare, prepare. Now, there you go. If you're thinking about buying a truck, don't wake up on Monday and say, we need to buy a truck on Tuesday. Put some thought into it. Reach out to Midwest Fire. Have some conversations. And and start to get some ideas flowing as you, as you heard from Dalton. You know the the best success stories are those that start about six months before they're going to actually buy the truck. Of just gathering thoughts and ideas and 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 trying to see what's available and what's best for them. So check them out, MidwestFire.com. Thank you, Midwest Fire President Sarah Atchison and all of your staff for your awesome commitment to improving first responder safety. And I sincerely appreciate your support of my mission and the sponsorship of this podcast show. Hey, if you're interested in seeing a listing of the upcoming Situational Awareness Tour Stop locations, head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Upcoming Events Schedule. Check it often because the schedule is continually being updated. I want to share a piece of feedback that I received about this podcast through iTunes. Every episode, I ask listeners to go to iTunes and say something nice if you like the show. I guess everyone thinks someone else is going to do it, because I don't get very many comments, although I really love when I do. I'd also like if you'd give the show a five-star review, if you like it, and that would really make my day. Anyhow, I don't share this feedback to brag. Rather, I share it to show my appreciation to those who are inspired by my message and take time to send me their encouragement. So this feedback says, seriously, this will help you achieve goal number one. This series is a must for any fire officer. I heard Dr. G speak yesterday, and he is the most functional PhD I have ever met Usually these guys educate themselves into oblivion, but this guy rocks. He makes so much sense. The number one goal of a fire officer should be to send his guys home safely and whole the next morning. Follow this advice truly. Listen and incorporate this, and it will help you to do just that. Wow. Thank you for that feedback on iTunes about the podcast and obviously about a live event that you attended as well, like a double win-win for me. I'm super jazzed up when I, when I get feedback like that, <clears throat> although I, I had to chuckle when you I read that you thought I was a functional PhD. There would be some who would maybe disagree with that. Uh, anyhow, if you'd like to send me uh, feedback directly, you can go to the SA Matters website and click on the Contact Us link, and that will just send me an email. If you haven't subscribed to the SA Matters radio podcast yet, go over to iTunes or Stitcher Radio and subscribe. And again, leave the feedback if you like it. Hey, in case you didn't know, I've written five books on situational awareness and high-risk decision-making. Five. These books contain critical lessons on improving situational awareness and decision-making under stress. You can check out all the books and videos that I have available on the SA Matters online store. Go to SA Matters website, click on the store link on the home page. You can also get the books through Amazon. If you get them through me, you'll get them, they'll be signed. I custom sign every book I sell. If you get them through Amazon, they go to you directly from Amazon. I won't get the chance to sign them then. If you're not a member of the SA Matters community of learners, there are several ways that you can do this. First, you can join as a member. There are over 5,000 members connected on SA Matters sharing lessons about how to improve situational awareness and improve decision-making under stress, how to train members to be critical thinkers and resilient problem solvers. Membership is free. When you sign up, I'll send you a special report I've created just for the new members called 25 Best Practices for Improving First Responder Safety. If you're not a member yet, head over to the SA Matters website. You see the theme here? Click on the red box on the right side of the homepage. It says free membership. Free. It's free. 
can get connected with me on social media as well, on Twitter, at Rich Gasway or at SA Matters on Twitter. Almost 17,000 connected on the Twitter feeds. Thanks for your support there. You can also join the private Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash SA Matters. 50% off discount coupon in the private Facebook group on the latest book. That'll save you 20 bucks. On LinkedIn, you can find me by searching Rich Gasaway. Also got some YouTube videos out there. Just go to YouTube and put in the search box SA Matters TV, SA Matters TV, and watch the videos. Well, that's it. Episode 116 is complete. Thank you again to my guest, Battalion Chief Ryan Pyle, for sharing your incredible story of the line of duty death of your associate. Join us next week when we'll have part two of this interview with Ryan when he talks about the aftermath to his department and the lessons learned. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Midwest Fire. Thank you to our live event hosts. And really, most of all, thank you, our listeners. Without you, there'd be no show. I appreciate you spending some of your valuable time with me today and the support. Be safe out there and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.